as you go about town, either to the doctor's office or out to eat or to get your car worked on or whatever, have you noticed that just about every waiting area in a restaurant or wherever you are in Blount County now has a TV in it? And I think there's an unwritten rule that every TV in a public area has to be channeling CNN or MSNBC or some daytime television talk show. It's usually turned up so loud that you can't not hear what they're talking about. Come on with it. Preach it, bro. I know, I know. But think about this. What, what thoughts are stirred in your heart when you hear a commentator, say, on a news show, arguing for a position on social justice with which you could not disagree more strongly? What kind of things and emotions are stirred? Do you ever get dragged into conversations either at work or at school where you're asked your opinion on some absolutely, utterly unimportant cultural topic? How do you typically respond? What's going on in your heart when that happens? Maybe you've been standing in the line at the grocery store and you happen to overhear a conversation happening just a couple feet away from you and And maybe audibly even, you just kind of say, ugh, because you're in absolute disbelief or or you feel this sense of disgust as you hear what they're talking about. Maybe you have a family member that, well, frankly, annoys you so much and your perspectives on life are so different that you've basically broken off conversation with them altogether. Now, it's tempting It's tempting to ignore or feel some type of animosity toward or just to look down upon people who who either have a different opinion than us or perhaps are just simply caught up in the cultural cesspool of the day. Now, the reason that I mention this is because condescension, and indifference and animosity are all antonyms of compassion. In today's passage, Jesus absolutely resets our perspective on people. Here in this passage, we behold the striking character of Jesus, which is so often in direct contrast to our own. Our passage this morning is Matthew 9, 35 through 10, 15. And here, brothers and sisters, the glorious word of Almighty God. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12, Jesus sent out instructing them, 
Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold, nor silver, nor copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Would you pray with me as we begin? Father, I, I confess, I, I do not know how to properly balance or to symmetrically present both the weightiness and the encouragement of this passage. But Holy Spirit, you are so wise. Spirit, you are so discerning. Indeed, you can probe even the deep mind of God. And so I ask that you, you would lead us now. Would you be active this morning? Active in my proclamation of this word and active in our reception of it as well. Shine light in the areas where you desire to shine light into the dark places of our hearts. Move in us and move among us, I ask, through the name and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we have the opportunity to uh, take communion together, and I love that this morning is a communion Sunday, because as we talk about the compassion of Jesus, and as we talk about the condition of the lost, we have a visual reminder before us of the cost of redeeming us from our sin. May God lead us as we walk through things. I think this will be helpful for us as we talk about the compassion of Jesus in chapter 9. And as we look at the commission that Jesus gives to his followers at the beginning of chapter 10. Now, to be blunt, right out of the gate, I am less interested in preaching what might be considered a good sermon, whatever that really even means, but I'm far more interested, far more excited about the possibility that the Holy Spirit will ignite and inflame missionary zeal in us as a result of our time gathered together this morning. Our main point is that the compassion of Jesus fuels the commission of Jesus. Let us begin then in verse 35 of chapter 9. Our first observation is that the compassion of Jesus is toward all people. Now, Matthew uses these final words here at the end of chapter 9 uh, as kind of hinge verses that seek to close out the thoughts that we've been talking about in uh, chapters 8 and 9 and to begin to introduce chapter 10 and his teaching section here, which is traditionally called the Missionary Discourse. It's the second of the five main teaching sections of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel that we've talked about on a couple of occasions. 
So then, verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. Now, when I say that the compassion of Jesus is for all people, we're noting two ideas primarily. First, that Jesus essentially went everywhere. He went in all the cities and villages. And they got to hear the gospel of the kingdom from the lips of Jesus. Think about that for a moment. All the people in the surrounding area got to hear the good news that the kingdom had arrived. Now, given the the Jewishness of Matthew's gospel that we've talked about, and given the very narrow focus, particularly on Israel, even in our passage this morning, It really is startling to see how liberal Jesus is with the proclamation of his message. He basically tells everyone about the good news. He went through all of the cities and his influence and the sizes of the crowds snowballed as he went. Now let's just pause here right out of the gate. Jesus basically shared the good news of the gospel of the kingdom with everyone in that region as he walked around and traveled. So think with me about the reality of where we find ourselves today. It's estimated that there are about 2.2 professing Christians in the world today. And it's also estimated that there are about 7.4, 7.5 billion people in the world. 2.2 billion Christians, 7.5 billion people. Quick math, right? Brothers and sisters, there are at least 5 billion people alive at this moment, who desperately need Jesus. Second, when we are noting that the compassion of Jesus is toward all people, we are noting a theme that Matthew, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has been developing for a while now in this gospel. And that is that the compassion of Jesus falls on all types of people. We've already seen a centurion's slave and the demon-possessed and a little girl, lepers, blind men, unclean women, tax collectors, just to name a few of the people who have benefited from the compassion of Jesus in his ministry. So what if you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus? Take heart. Take heart because this means that no matter who you are, no matter what you have done, no matter what you have been through in your life, the compassion of the most merciful man in the history of the world has been customized to specifically meet every single one of your needs. Rejoice. Because the king of the universe is utterly compassionate. That perfectly sets us up for our second point, which is this. The compassion of Jesus recognizes our pain. Believer and unbeliever. Verse 36. When he saw the crowds... He had compassion for them because they were harassed. Or if you're more sophisticated, uh, harassed. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, sometimes when we're walking through the word, it's really helpful to dig into the original meanings of the words. This is one of those cases because it sheds light 
on the reality of what is being said here. It helps us to feel the weight and the power of this description. The word translated compassion here means that Jesus felt compassion from his gut. In other words, it literally translates from his bowels. Have you ever been so heartbroken or maybe so scared or maybe even just excited that that you could feel your insides churning? Sometimes when you feel scared, it, it, you have that f- feeling that, you're, that your insides are hollow. When you're just heartbroken, we call it gut-wrenching emotion because we feel it at the core of our being. Even when we're excited, sometimes we talk about it's having butterflies in our stomach, right? Because there's always stuff going on inside of us when we're, when we're experiencing something that's that's powerful to us. That's important. It's important because this compassion that Jesus feels for the crowds aren't just pleasant thoughts from a, from a super nice guy. Right? His compassion is deep. His compassion is genuine. And it is intensely powerful. Jesus isn't interested in just checking the box on what was needed to secure our salvation from the wrath of God against sin. Tell me what the minimum requirement is. I'll do that. Jesus is interested in our pain. The two words here, translated harassed and helpless, literally mean skinned alive or flayed. And thrown down, utterly helpless. So do you get the imagery here? Jesus is demonstrating compassion for the people in the crowds who he views as being bullied, thrown down, skinned alive, and not allowed to get up. This is Jesus' assessment of the ministry of the Pharisees because they were The leaders. He says this people is leaderless. Do you get, do you begin to get an idea of why they hated him? Jesus feels this pain at the core of his being because he's not only interested in our pain, he identifies with the depth of it. Because Jesus himself was essentially skinned alive. He was bullied. He was mocked. He was hung on a tree. These people had no hope and they were leaderless. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Which demonstrates that the compassion of Jesus addresses our ultimate problem, which is our third observation from this section. Verse 37, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So, again, for the third time, notice the emphasis on the scope of the work. It's all the cities and villages. It's the crowds, the size of the crowds. They were harassed. And here the harvest is plentiful. But the way that Matthew presents it, there appears to be a problem because of how massive the undertaking is. We know God can do all things, but Jesus exhorts us to pray earnestly that God will send out workers. Why doesn't Jesus just say, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, so go! 
Go! Tell them the good news. Why does Jesus say, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, therefore, pray? Why? It's because the sovereign God of the universe has ordained that he would bring people to salvation, to himself, through means. Namely, the simple means of the proclamation of the gospel. Simple acts of compassion in his name. And the prayers of his people. God loves to respond to the prayers of his people. Think about what a noble calling it is that we have the opportunity to be human instruments through whom God accomplishes his redemptive purposes in the world. Is there any higher privilege? So he begins, pray, because God loves to respond to the prayers of his people. I was listening this week to a message from one of the guest uh, speakers or preachers at, at Boyce College's chapel there at Southern Seminary. He was preaching on missions, and I was using it to stir my heart as I prepared for this week. And he was talking about the importance of prayer. And he, if, if I have the details correct, there were, there were two Asian women in his church, and, and one of the women was telling him this story. They had previously been out in the mission field together somewhere in Asia. One of them had to come home. This is the lady that was telling him the story. The other remained in missions in Asia. She was telling this man that who was her pastor, that she, she had been really busy for the previous three days. because She had committed to pray for this woman, her sister, every day. But she'd been so busy that she had forgotten, literally, to pray for her for three days. So she knelt down quickly and, and, and took about 15 minutes to pray for her. But she was still just troubled in her spirit. And so she called her and was able to get a hold of her. And she said, she said how are you doing? And she said, well, to be completely honest, the last three days have been the worst of my entire time here. I have never felt such oppression and spiritual attack. But praise God in the last 15 minutes, God has refreshed my soul. God loves to answer the prayers of his people. As one man said, I strongly suspect that if we saw all the difference, even the tiniest of our prayers to God make, and all the people those little prayers were destined to affect, and all the consequences of those effects down through the centuries, we would be so paralyzed with awe at the power of prayer that we would be unable to get up off our knees for the rest of our lives. So Jesus says, pray, pray. And the prayer that we are to pray is that the Lord of the harvest would send out workers into the harvest. Now the idea of a huge harvest kind of brings to mind this wonderful imagery of abundance and blessing. But the concept of harvest in the Bible is also very closely associated with judgment. Our greatest problem is the reality of God's judgment on our sin. Listen to the connection between harvest and judgment from Joel 3, 13 and 14. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for the evil of the nations is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. What problem do we most need addressed? We need the guilt of our sin removed. And so do five billion people in the world who do not 
know Jesus. When the guilt of our sin is removed through faith, we are then commissioned to proclaim this good news to others. In other words, the remission for sin is available for you too through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. This is exactly the dynamic that was at play for the prophet Isaiah. After beholding the glory of the Lord and having his sin atoned for with a burning coal that touched his lips, the prophet Isaiah immediately, immediately heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah 6, 8. And Isaiah responded, here I am. Send me. After receiving compassion from God, Isaiah was immediately commissioned by God. God said, go and say this to my people. Now what's fascinating about this is that Jesus also connects the language of harvest with judgment in chapter 13 of Matthew's gospel. We'll be there in a couple of, probably a couple of weeks, right? Listen to what Jesus says. He's explaining why he uses parables. And, and how does he do it? Jesus quotes Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. In other words, the very same words God commanded Isaiah to speak when God commissioned him to proclaim good news to Israel several hundred years before Jesus walked on the earth. This commissioning leads us then very naturally to chapter 10. And the commissioning of the 12 apostles, chapter 10 and verse 1. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every Affliction. Now, in verse 1 and following, we need to make an important interpretive distinction between description and prescription. That is, the distinction between describing what's happening here in context in the passage and prescribing for us what we ought to do in light of what it says here. Verse 1 and verse 2. Five, explicitly say that Jesus was directly addressing the twelve. Now, after Matthew mentions the twelve disciples in verse one, he goes on in verse two to call them the twelve apostles and to list each one by name for the sake of clarity. To be one of the twelve specific apostles was a unique designation in redemptive history. What is occurring in these first few verses of chapter 10 is a very specific purpose. I think it's much like Jesus, the 12 apostles begin the proclamation of good news with Israel itself as the message moves from inside outward. Israel will hear the good news that her Messiah has come. And then for all those who embrace this truth, on whom this light has shined, They will serve as a light for all nations in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Therefore, we need to think very clearly here. When Matthew goes on to describe the instructions that Jesus gave the 12 apostles in this unique moment in redemptive history, we ought not to assume that Matthew is prescribing for us the exact same instructions or methodology or even results. Now, that's not to say that he doesn't do that in other texts, and there aren't multiple examples in other places of the fact that other believers had these experiences. But in the context of this section, it's very clear that the immediate context is in addressing the twelve. They have a much narrower narrower mission. Now, This does not mean that we shouldn't draw key principles from what we see here. 
in this specific, uh, specific event. Indeed, that's exactly what we should do. Here's the distinction. The distinction is to understand that our specific charge as followers of Jesus in the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel is a command to make disciples, to teach, and to baptize. But we don't have to wait all the way till chapter 28 to get this command. Matthew begins to develop it now. Here we see that it starts in the innermost circle and then immediately moves outward. We'll see even next week that Jesus begins to generalize this commission to his other followers, and we'll we'll talk about that more next week. For this week, then, what are the principles that are instructive, even prescriptive for us that we can draw from this event? For starters, before Jesus sends anyone out, he first draws them to himself. Chapter 10 and verse 1. Before we would ever think to declare good news about Jesus, we first need to delight in the good news about Jesus. Coming to Jesus is less about making some kind of decision that of the available options of religious leaders in the world, he, on balance, is probably the best of the group. Now, undoubtedly, he is. But coming to Jesus means that we see him as he is in all of his glorious splendor as redeemer and as king. We behold his glory as revealed in scripture. And therefore, when we come to him, when we are drawn by him, we understand that he is of such an utterly unique magnificence and majesty that it seems ludicrous to us to compare him to anyone else. He alone is inherently and incomparably glorious. This is what we see when our eyes are opened to the truth of the gospel. Now, in the economy of evangelism, it is imperative that we have first enjoyed the gospel before we would ever be deployed for the sake of the gospel. Which brings us to verse 5 and our deployment. Chapter 10, verse 5 through verse 8. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, right away we realize this is different than our commission, our, our great commission, command, right? Because where are we supposed to go? Out, everywhere across the ocean, to the ends of the earth, right? Listen to this very specific command. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Inside, out. Starting inside, going out. And proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. Jesus has given them authority. Matthew's been building this case all the way along that Jesus has authority. Here we see something astonishing. Jesus is giving delegated authority to men. Indeed, he is a man, but he is also fully God. Now he's giving delegated authority to fishermen, zealots, tax collectors, This is absolutely revolutionary, and it is nothing less than astonishing. In verse 5, we learn that once we have been called by Jesus, we are then sent out by Jesus. David Platt makes the very clear point, as he so often does, that we live not just to celebrate the good news, but we live to spread the good news. Every believer is called to the mission of spreading the good news about Jesus. Every single believer. Now, our roles may vary here. Some of us are senders, some of us are goers, but all of us are spreaders. 
every person who has actually met Jesus will have a desire for others to meet him too. In this section, we see a great example of the specificity of their charge. I've already noted that it was a narrower target audience. So what's the purpose of the miracles that he gives them authority to do? I think in this case, it's very similar to Moses, who was able to do miracles before Pharaoh. I think that Jesus, when they go out and they proclaim good news, He wants these miracles to attest to the authority that they have. Now, when we go out and preach the good news, we're able to preach the power of the cross. But think where we are in Matthew's gospel here. So far, the message is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, how are they going to know that? What's different? What's so revolutionary about that? It sounds good, but so what? Watch this. Dead guy. Lift. If dead guy gets up, that'll get your attention, right? That is power as has never before been seen in Israel, which is exactly how they describe the ministry of Jesus. Now, as we go then, another principle is that we must learn to depend upon him. Verses uh, 8 through 11 or the end of 8. Through actually through 13. You receive without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold, nor silver, nor copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it, and if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it, but if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. There's a lot of interesting stuff in here. First of all, remember that we're not saying that this is prescriptive for us, and we know that if if you go out onto the mission field, no one's going to condemn you if you take an extra pair of shoes or anything like that, right? But in this case, Jesus was making a very specific point, that they were to depend entirely upon him. Now, this word for worthy is really interesting. It's, it's, it's basically the word for weight or weightiness. It's a little bit, it's the same word that Paul uses when he says the, the struggles of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glories to come. So what's his point here? I, I think his point is, if you go into a house and they don't find any weight to your words, They don't take you seriously. I mean, have you ever had a conversation with your kids and you're trying to explain something to them and you just can see it in their eyes? They're somewhere else, right? And you're you're imploring them about something important, right? And they're they're just not tracking with you, right? You need to come up with another strategy in that moment. Now, it's one thing. if If they're opposing you strongly about what you're saying, you stay engaged at that moment. I think that would be true here. But when do you shift gears? You shift gears when... They're just not taking what you're saying seriously. There's no weight to your words to them. So you need a, a different tactic. And I, I, think, I think what Jesus is saying here is you go into a house and you share with them this good news and they say, oh, whatever, who cares? Then leave. Don't waste your time. Move on. If they're opposing, stay engaged. If they receive it, praise the Lord. Let your peace, that is the blessing, go upon them. Remember, these guys have delegated authority. May the Lord's blessing be upon you. I mean, we even do that this day. The reason that we close the the service with a benediction is because I'm praying a blessing over us, trusting that God will do it. Not doing it because it's a nice way to close out the service. I mean, it may be. But if we don't believe what I'm saying, what I'm praying, what God might do through that, then I'm wasting my time. In a similar way, they need to be very discerning as they engage people, whether they decide to let the peace of the Lord rest upon them or retract it. Now, there is nothing like missions to 
reminds you of how dependent upon God you actually are. It's true for you whether you're going from one town to another to do ministry. If you move from Louisville, Kentucky to Maryville, Tennessee to do ministry, you have to depend upon the Lord. You have to depend upon the Lord if you're moving from the comfort of your living room to your neighbor's front porch. You have to depend upon the Lord if you're moving across the globe to tell people this good news. The, the needs are almost, almost endless. We need money for the journey. We need words for the conversations. We need strength for the hard times. We need joy in the good times. We need resolve when we are attacked. We need perseverance to press on. We need wisdom to know who to share with, what to share specifically, who to minister to. Isn't that exactly what Jesus is talking about in this passage? I think it is. So we need wisdom to know in some measure who might cause us trouble. We need to be very discerning. Shrewd as serpents, innocent as doves. We need power. We need discernment. We need cultural sensitivity. We need gospel clarity. We need conviction. We need vision. And we need hope. In short, we need to learn to depend upon God. And we need the promise of Jesus that as we go, he will be with us always, even to the end of the age. Let that encourage your heart. In these last couple of verses, we realize that we are declaring good news about him. Now, you might look at 14 and 15 and say, where do you get good news out of this? And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. For one thing, What we're proclaiming is, verse 7, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, so it's good news. Secondly, anything that rescues a person from the wrath of God against sin as demonstrated in Sodom and Gomorrah, that's good news. That's exceedingly good news. What is so tragic is that Jesus is saying, despite that reality, there will be some who refuse to receive it. Now again, I think what is happening in this immediate account is somewhat unique in that the delegated authority of Israel's Messiah and the good news that he has finally come is first being shown to be received or to be rejected by God's people, Israel. That's just John 1, 11, and 12. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Nonetheless, it is instructive for us that not all people see the good news that there is a rescue for sinners from the condemnation of God. Not all people see that as good news. The reason is because it points us to the reality of the cross. Some see substitutionary atonement as a stumbling block. Others see the miracle of Calvary as utter foolishness. And then there are those who place their faith in Jesus and we celebrate it. May we also proclaim it throughout the world. We are reminded here in these final couple of verses that the consequences could not be more serious. Here is where compassion for those who are lost must arise within us. Because the compassion of Jesus is what fuels the commission of Jesus. Therefore, as we prepare to take communion together, we are reminded again of the sacrifice that was necessary for our sin to be forgiven by God. For us to be rescued from the condemnation of God and His wrath against sin. Brothers and sisters, it is here we are reminded that the compassion of God kissed the condemnation of God at the cross. Justice and mercy met at the cross of Calvary. And herein lies the miracle 
of redemption. We show compassion for others because Jesus first showed compassion to us. In other words, the compassion of Jesus fuels the commission of Jesus. Now, as we prepare to take communion, we're going to take the elements together. So if you could come up to the communion table uh, from the, uh, through the inside aisle and then return to your seats on the outside aisle, you do not need to be a member of River Oaks Community Church to participate in this table of grace. You do, however, needed to have repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ as the only reason that you are acceptable in the Father's sight. But if you have done that, you are adored and accepted and loved by your Father in heaven because the blood of Jesus is able to wash away all of the guilt of our sin. Let me pray for us. Uh, The small group that's assisting, would you come up? And then when you're ready, you can come and take the elements. Again, return on the outside, and we'll take the elements together in a few minutes. Uh, Father, I again ask you to help us. Help us to see the, the weightiness of this charge. Correct us where our hearts have been anything but compassionate toward the lost, then I pray that you would give us the compassion of Jesus as we this morning contemplate again the reality of the cost, his sacrifice on our behalf in order to redeem us from sin. To that end, Spirit of the living God, minister to us and convince us once again of the reality of grace. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.